This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 3, Part 2. When I woke up shortly after midnight, his warning came to my mind with its hint of danger that seemed, in the starred darkness, real enough to make me get up for the purpose of having a look around. On the hill a big fire burned, illuminating fitfully a crooked corner of the station-house. One of the agents, with a picket of a few of our blacks, armed for the purpose, was keeping guard over the ivory. But deep within the forest, red gleams that wavered that seemed to sink and rise from the ground amongst confused columnar shapes of intense blackness, showed the exact position of the camp where Mr. Kurtz's adorers were keeping their uneasy vigil. The monotonous beating of a big drum filled the air with muffled shocks and a lingering vibration. A steady droning sound of many men chanting each to himself some weird incantation came out from a hive, and had a strange narcotic effect upon my half-awake senses. I believe I dozed off leaning over the rail, till an abrupt burst of yells, an overwhelming outbreak of a pent-up and mysterious frenzy, woke me up in a bewildered wonder. It was cut short all at once, and the low droning went on with an effect of audible and soothing silence. I glanced casually into the little cabin. A light was burning within, but Mr. Kurtz was not there. I think I would have raised an outcry if I had believed my eyes, but I didn't believe them at first. The thing seemed so impossible. The fact is, I was completely unnerved by a sheer blank fright, pure abstract terror, unconnected with any distinct shape of physical danger. What made this emotion so overpowering was—how shall I define it—the moral shock I received, as if something altogether monstrous— intolerable to thought and odious to the soul had been thrust upon me unexpectedly. This lasted, of course, the merest fraction of a second, and then the usual sense of commonplace deadly danger, the possibility of a sudden onslaught and massacre, or something of the kind, which I saw impending, was positively welcome and composing. It pacified me, in fact, so much that I did not raise an alarm. There was an agent buttoned up inside an ulster and sleeping on a chair on deck within three feet of me. The yells had not awakened him. He snored very slightly. I left him to his slumbers and leapt ashore. I did not betray Mr. Kurtz. It was ordered I should never betray him. It was written I should be loyal to the nightmare of my choice. I was anxious to deal with the shadow by myself, alone, and to this day I don't know why I was so jealous of sharing with anyone the peculiar blackness of that experience. As soon as I got on the bank I saw a trail, a broad trail through the grass. I remember the exultation with which I said to myself, He can't walk, he is crawling on all fours. I've got him. The grass was wet with dew. I strode rapidly with clenched fists. I fancy I had some vague notion of falling upon him and giving him a drubbing, I don't know. I had some imbecile thoughts. The knitting old woman with the cat obtruded herself upon my memory as a most improper person to be sitting at the other end of such an affair. I saw a row of pilgrims squirting lead in the air out of Winchester's hell to the hip. I thought I would never get back to the steamer, and imagined myself living alone and unarmed in the woods to an advanced age. Such silly things, you know and I remember I confounded the beat of the drum with the beating of my heart, and was pleased at its calm regularity. I kept to the track, though, then stopped to listen. The night was very clear, a dark blue space sparkling with dew and starlight, in which black things stood very still. I thought I could see a kind of motion ahead of me. I was strangely cocksure of everything that night. I actually left the track and ran in a wide semicircle. I verily believe, chuckling to myself, so as to get in front of that stir, of that motion I had seen, if indeed I had seen anything. I was circumventing Kurtz as though it had been a boyish game. I came upon him, and if he had not heard me coming I would have fallen over him too, but he got up in time. 
He rose, unsteady, long, pale, indistinct, like a vapor exhaled by the earth, and swayed slightly, misty and silent before me, while at my back the fires loomed between the trees, and the murmur of many voices issued from the forest. I had cut him off cleverly, but when actually confronting him I seemed to come to my senses. I saw the danger in its right proportion. It was by no means over yet. Suppose he began to shout. Though he could hardly stand, there was still plenty of vigor in his voice. "'Go away. Hide yourself,' he said in that profound tone. It was very awful. I glanced back. We were within thirty yards from the nearest fire. A black figure stood up, strode on long black legs, waving long black arms, across the glow. It had horns. Antelope horns, I think, on its head. Some sorcerer, some witch-man, no doubt. It looked fiend-like enough. "'Do you know what you are doing?' I whispered. "'Perfectly,' he answered, raising his voice for that single word. It sounded to me far off, and yet loud, like a hail through a speaking-trumpet. "'If he makes a row we are lost,' I thought to myself. This clearly was not a case for fisticuffs, even apart from the very natural aversion I had to beat that shadow, this wandering and tormented thing. "'You will be lost,' I said, "'utterly lost.' One gets sometimes such a flash of inspiration, you know. I did say the right thing, though indeed he could not have been more irretrievably lost than he was at this very moment. When the foundations of our intimacy were being laid, to endure, to endure, even to the end, even beyond. I had immense plans, he muttered irresolutely. Yes, said I. But if you try to shout, I'll smash your head with— There was not a stick or a stone near. I will throttle you for good, I corrected myself. I was on the threshold of great things, he pleaded, in a voice of longing, with a wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. And now for this stupid scoundrel. Your success in Europe is assured in any case, I affirmed steadily. I did not want to have the throttling of him, you understand, and indeed it would have been very little use for any practical purpose. I tried to break the spell, the heavy, mute spell of the wilderness, that seemed to draw him to its pitiless breast by the awakening of forgotten and brutal instincts, by the memory of gratified and monstrous passions. This alone, I was convinced, had driven him out to the edge of the forest, to the bush, towards the gleam of fires, the throb of drums, the drone of weird incantations. This alone had beguiled his unlawful soul beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations. And don't you see, the terror of the position was not in being knocked on the head, although I had a very lively sense of that danger, too, but in this that I had to deal with a being to whom I could not appeal in the name of anything high or low. I had, even like the niggers, to invoke him, himself, his own exalted and incredible degradation. There was nothing either above or below him, and I knew it. He had kicked himself loose of the earth. Confound the man! He had kicked the very earth to pieces. He was alone, and I before him did not know whether I stood on the ground or floated in the air. I've been telling you what we said, repeating the phrases we pronounced, but what's the good? They were common everyday words, the familiar, vague sounds exchanged on every waking day of life. But what of that? They had behind them, to my mind, the terrific suggestiveness of words heard in dreams, of phrases spoken in nightmares. Soul! If anybody ever struggled with a soul, I am the man." and I wasn't arguing with a lunatic either. Believe me or not, his intelligence was perfectly clear, concentrated, it is true, upon himself with horrible intensity, yet clear. And therein was my only chance, barring, of course, the killing him there and then, which wasn't so good on account of unavoidable noise. But his soul was mad. Being alone in the wilderness, 
it had looked within itself, and by heavens, I tell you, it had gone mad. I had, for my sins, I suppose, to go through the ordeal of looking into it myself. No eloquence could have been so withering to one's belief in mankind as his final burst of sincerity. He struggled within himself, too. I saw it. I heard it. I saw the inconceivable mystery of a soul that knew no restraint, no faith, and no fear, yet struggling blindly with itself. I kept my head pretty well, but when I had him at last stretched on the couch, I wiped my forehead while my legs shook under me as though I had carried half a ton on my back down that hill. And yet I had only supported him, his bony arm clasped around my neck, and he was not much heavier than a child. When next day we left at noon, the crowd, of whose presence behind the curtain of trees I had been acutely conscious of all the time, flowed out of the woods again, filling the clearing, covered the slope with a mass of naked, breathing, quivering bronzed bodies. I steamed up a bit, then swung downstream, and two thousand eyes followed the evolutions of the splashing, thumping, fierce river demon, beating the water with its terrible tail, and breathing black smoke into the air. In front of the first rank, along the river, three men, plastered with bright red earth from head to foot, strutted to and fro restlessly. When we came abreast again, they faced the river, stamped their feet, nodded their horned heads, swayed their scarlet bodies. They shook towards the fierce river demon a bunch of black feathers, a mangy skin with a pendant tail, something that looked like a dried gourd. They shouted periodically together strings of amazing words that resembled no sounds of human language. And the deep murmurs of the crowd, interrupted suddenly, were like the responses of some satanic litany. We had carried Kurtz into the pilot house. There was more air there. Lying on the couch, he stared through the open shutter. There was an eddy on the mass of human bodies, and the woman with helmeted head and tawny cheeks rushed out to the very brink of the stream. She put out her hands, shouting something, and all that wild mob took up the shout in a roaring chorus of articulated, rapid, breathless utterance. "'Do you understand this?' I asked. He kept on looking out past me, with fiery, longing eyes with a mingled expression of wistfulness and hate. He made no answer, but I saw a smile, a smile of indefinable meaning, appear on his colorless lips, that a moment after twitched convulsively. "'Do I not?' he said slowly, gasping, as if the words had been torn out of him by a supernatural power. I pulled the string of the whistle, and I did this because I saw the pilgrims on deck getting out their rifles with an air of anticipating a jolly lark. At the sudden screech there was a movement of abject terror through that wedged mass of bodies. "'Don't! Don't you frighten them away!' cried someone on deck disconsolately. I pulled the string time after time. They broke and ran. They leaped. They crouched. They swerved. They dodged the flying terror of the sound." The three red chaps had fallen flat, face down on the shore, as though they had been shot dead. Only the barbarous and superb woman did not so much as flinch, and stretched tragically her bare arms after us, over the somber and glittering river. And then that imbecile crowd down on the deck started their little fun, and I could see nothing more for smoke. The brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness bearing us down towards the sea with twice the speed of our upward progress. And Kurtz's life was running swiftly, too, ebbing, ebbing out of his heart into the sea of inexorable time. The manager was very placid. He had no vital anxieties now. He took us both in with a comprehensive and satisfied glance. The affair had come off as well as could be wished. I saw the time approaching when I would be left alone of the party of unsound method. The pilgrims looked upon me with disfavor. I was, so to speak, numbered with the dead. It is strange how I accepted this unforeseen partnership, this choice of nightmares forced upon me in the tenebrous land, invaded by these mean and greedy phantoms. Kurtz discoursed. A voice! A voice! It rang deep to the very last. 
It survived his strength to hide in the magnificent folds of eloquence the barren darkness of his heart. Oh, he struggled, he struggled. The wastes of his weary brain were haunted by shadowy images now, images of wealth and fame revolving obsequiously around his inextinguishable gift of noble and lofty expression. My intended, my station, my career, my ideas— these were the subjects for the occasional utterances of elevated sentiments. The shade of the original Kurtz frequented the bedside of the hollow sham, whose fate it was to be buried presently in the mould of primeval earth. But both the diabolic love and the unearthly hate of the mysteries it had penetrated fought for the possession of that soul, satiated with primitive emotions, avid of lying fame, of sham distinction of all the appearances of success and power. Sometimes he was contemptibly childish. He desired to have kings meet him at railway stations on his return from some ghastly nowhere, where he intended to accomplish great things. You show them you have in you something that is really profitable, and then there will be no limits to the recognition of your ability, he would say. Of course, you must take care of the motives, right motives, always. The long reaches that were like one and the same reach, monotonous bends that were exactly alike slipped past the steamer with their multitude of secular trees, looking patiently after this grimy fragment of another world. The forerunner of change, of conquest, of trade, of massacres, of blessings. I looked ahead, piloting. Close the shutter, said Kurt suddenly one day. I can't bear to look at this. I did so. There was a silence. Oh, but I will wring your heart yet, he cried at the invisible wilderness. We broke down, as I had expected, and had to lie up for repairs at the head of an island. This delay was the first thing that shook Kurtz's confidence. One morning he gave me a packet of papers and a photograph, the lot tied together with a shoestring. "'Keep this for me,' he said. "'This noxious fool,' meaning the manager, "'is capable of prying into my boxes when I am not looking.' "'In the afternoon I saw him. "'He was lying on his back with closed eyes, "'and I withdrew quickly, but I heard him mutter, "'Live rightly, die, die.' "'I listened. "'There was nothing more. "'Was he rehearsing some speech in his sleep?' or was it a fragment of a phrase from some newspaper article? He had been writing for the papers and meant to do so again. For the furthering of my ideas, it's a duty. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as you peer down a man who is lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. But I had not much time to give him, because I was helping the engine driver to take to pieces the leaky cylinders to straighten a bent connecting rod, and in other such matters. I lived in an infernal mess of rust, filings, nuts, bolts, spanners, hammers, ratchet drills, things I abominate because I don't get on with them. I tended the little fort we fortunately had aboard. I toiled warily in a wretched scrap heap unless I had the shakes too bad to stand. One evening, coming in with a candle, I was startled to hear him say, a little tremulously, I am lying here in the dark waiting for death. The light was within a foot of his eyes. I forced myself to murmur, Oh, nonsense, and stood over him as if transfixed. Anything approaching the change that came over his features I have never seen before, and hope never to see again. Oh, I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent. I saw on that ivory face the expression of sombre pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper, at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath. The horror! The horror! I blew the candle out and left the cabin. 
The pilgrims were dining in the mess-room, and I took my place opposite the manager, who lifted his eyes to give me a questioning glance, which I successfully ignored. He leaned back, serene, with that peculiar smile of his sealing the unexpressed depths of his meanness. A continuous shower of small flies streamed upon the lamp, upon the cloth, upon our hands and faces. Suddenly the manager's boy put his insolent black head in the doorway and said in a tone of scathing contempt, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. All the pilgrims rushed out to see. I remained and went on with my dinner. I believe I was considered brutally callous. However, I did not eat much. There was a lamp in there. Light, you don't know, and outside it was so beastly, beastly dark. I went no more near the remarkable man who had pronounced a judgment upon the adventures of his soul on this earth. The voice was gone. What else had been there? But I am of course aware that next day the pilgrims buried something in a muddy hole. And then they very nearly buried me. However, as you see, I did not go to join Kurtz there and then. I did not. I remained to dream the nightmare out to the end, and to show my loyalty to Kurtz once more. Destiny, my destiny. Droll thing life is, that mysterious arrangement of merciless logic for a futile purpose. The most you can hope from it is some knowledge of yourself that comes too late, a crop of unextinguishable regrets. I have wrestled with death. It is the most unexciting contest you can imagine. It takes place in an impalpable grayness, with nothing underfoot, with nothing around, without spectators, without clamor, without glory, without the great desire of victory, without the great fear of defeat, in a sickly atmosphere of tepid skepticism, without much belief in your own right, and still less in that of your adversary. If such is the form of ultimate wisdom, then life is a greater riddle than some of us think it to be. I was within a hair's breadth of the last opportunity for pronouncement, and I found with humiliation that probably I would have nothing to say. This is the reason why I affirm that Kurtz was a remarkable man. He had something to say. He said it. Since I had peeped over the edge myself, I understood better the meaning of his stare, that could not see the flame of the candle, but was wide enough to embrace the whole universe, piercing enough to penetrate all the hearts that beat in the darkness. He had summed up. He had judged. The horror! He was a remarkable man. After all, this was the expression of some sort of belief. It had candor. It had conviction. It had a vibrating note of revolt in its whisper. It had the appalling face of a glimpsed truth, the strange commingling of desire and hate. And it is not my own extremity I remember best. A vision of grayness without form filled with physical pain, and a careless contempt for the evanescence of all things, even of this pain itself. No, it is his extremity that I seem to have lived through. True, he had made that last stride. He had stepped over the edge while I had been permitted to draw back my hesitating foot. And perhaps in this is the whole difference. Perhaps all the wisdom and all truth and all sincerity are just compressed into that inappreciable moment of time in which we step over the threshold of the invisible. Perhaps. I like to think my summing up would not have been a word of careless contempt. Better his cry. Much better. It was an affirmation, a moral victory paid for by innumerable defeats, by abominable terrors, by abominable satisfactions. But it was a victory. That is why I have remained loyal to Kurtz to the last, and even beyond, when a long time after I heard once more, not his own voice, but the echo of his magnificent eloquence thrown to me from a soul as translucently pure as a cliff of crystal. No, they did not bury me, though there is a period of time which I remember mistily, 
with a shuddering wonder, like a passage through some inconceivable world that had no hope in it and no desire. I found myself back in the sepulchral city, resenting the sight of people hurrying through the streets to filch a little money from each other, to devour their infamous cookery, to gulp their unwholesome beer, to dream their insignificant and silly dreams. They trespassed upon my thoughts. They were intruders whose knowledge of life was to me an irritating pretense, because I felt so sure they could not possibly know the things I knew. Their bearing, which was simply the bearing of commonplace individuals, going about their business in the assurance of perfect safety, was offensive to me like the outrageous flauntings of folly in the face of a danger it is unable to comprehend. I had no particular desire to enlighten them, but I had some difficulty in restraining myself from laughing in their faces, so full of stupid importance. I dare say I was not very well at that time. I tottered about the streets. There were various affairs to settle, grinning bitterly at perfectly respectable persons. I admit my behavior was inexcusable, but then my temperature was seldom normal in these days. My dear aunt's endeavors to nurse up my strength seemed altogether beside the mark. It was not my strength that wanted nursing. It was my imagination that wanted soothing. I kept the bundle of papers given me by Kurtz, not knowing exactly what to do with it. His mother had died lately, watched over, as I was told, by his intended. A clean-shaved man, with an official manner and wearing gold-rimmed spectacles, called on me one day and made inquiries, at first circuitous and afterwards suavely pressing, about what he was pleased to denominate certain documents. I was not surprised because I had had two rows with the manager on the subject out there. I had refused to give up the smallest scrap out of that package, and I took the same attitude with the spectacled man. He became darkly menacing at last, and with much heat argued that the company had the right to every bit of information about its territories. And said he, Mr. Kurtz's knowledge of unexplored regions must have been necessarily extensive and peculiar, owing to his great abilities and to the deplorable circumstances in which he had been placed. Therefore, I assured him Mr. Kurtz's knowledge, however extensive, did not bear upon the problems of commerce or administration. He invoked then the name of science. It would be an incalculable loss if, etc., etc., I offered him the report on the suppression of savage customs, with the postscriptum torn off. He took it up eagerly, but ended up by sniffing at it with an air of contempt. "'This is not what we had a right to expect,' he remarked. "'Expect nothing else,' I said. "'There are only private letters.' He withdrew upon some threat of legal proceedings, and I saw him no more. But another fellow, calling himself Kurtz's cousin, appeared two days later, and was anxious to hear all the details about his dear relative's last moments. Incidentally, he gave me to understand that Kurtz had been essentially a great musician. "'There was the making of an immense success,' said the man, who was an organist, I believe, with lank grey hair flowing over a greasy coat-collar. I had no reason to doubt his statement, and to this day I am unable to say what was Kurtz's profession, whether he ever had any, which was the greatest of his talents. I had taken him for a painter who wrote for the papers, or else for a journalist who could paint, but even the cousin, who took snuff during the interview, could not tell me what he had been exactly. He was a universal genius. On that point I agreed with the old chap who thereupon blew his nose noisily into a large cotton handkerchief, and withdrew in senile agitation, bearing off some family letters and memoranda without importance. Ultimately, a journalist, anxious to know something of the fate of his dear colleague, turned up. This visitor informed me Kurtz's proper sphere ought to have been politics, on the popular side. He had furry, straight eyebrows, bristly hair cropped short, an eyeglass on a broad ribbon, and, becoming expansive, confessed his opinion that Kurtz really couldn't write a bit. But, heavens, how that man could talk! He electrified large meetings. He had faith. Don't you see? He had the faith. 
He could get himself to believe anything, anything. He would have been a splendid leader of an extreme party. What party? I asked. Any party, answered the other. He was an, an extremist. Did I not think so? I assented. Did I know, he asked, with a sudden flash of curiosity, what it was that had induced him to go out there? Yes, said I, and forthwith handed him the famous report for publication, if he thought fit. He glanced through it hurriedly, mumbling all the time, judged, it would do, and took himself off with this plunder. Thus I was left at last with a slim packet of letters, and the girl's portrait. She struck me as beautiful. I mean, she had a beautiful expression. I know that the sunlight can be made to lie, too, yet one felt that no manipulation of light and pose could have conveyed the delicate shade of truthfulness upon those features. She seemed ready to listen without mental reservation, without suspicion, without a thought for herself. I concluded I would go and give her back her portrait and those letters myself. Curiosity? Yes and also some other feeling, perhaps. All that had been Kurtz's had passed out of my hands. His soul, his body, his station, his plans, his ivory, his career. There remained only his memory and his intended. And I wanted to give that up, too, to the past, in a way, to surrender personally all that remained of him with me to that oblivion which is the last word of our common fate. I don't defend myself. I had no clear perception of what it was I really wanted. Perhaps it was an impulse of unconscious loyalty, or the fulfillment of one of those ironic necessities that lurk in the facts of human existence. I don't know. I can't tell. But I went. I thought his memory was like the other memories of the dead that accumulate in every man's life. A vague impress on the brain of shadows that had fallen on it in their swift and final passage. But before the high and ponderous door, between the tall houses of a street as still and decorous as a well-kept alley in a cemetery, I had a vision of him on a stretcher, opening his mouth voraciously, as if to devour all the earth with all its mankind. He lived, then, before me. He lived as much as he had ever lived, a shadow insatiable of splendid appearances, of frightful realities a shadow darker than the shadow of the night, and draped nobly in the folds of a gorgeous eloquence. The vision seemed to enter the house with me, the stretcher, the phantom-bearers, the wild crowd of obedient worshippers, the gloom of the forest, the glitter of the reach between the murky bends, the beat of the drum, regular and muffled like the beating of a heart, the heart of a conquering darkness. It was a moment of triumph for the wilderness, an invading and vengeful rush, which, it seemed to me, I would have to keep back alone for the salvation of another soul. And the memory of what I had heard him say afar there, with the horned shapes stirring at my back, in the glow of fires, within the patient woods, those broken phrases came back to me, were heard again in their ominous and terrifying simplicity. I remembered his abject pleading, his abject threats, the colossal scale of his vile desires, the meanness, the torment, the tempestuous anguish of his soul. And later on I seemed to see his collected languid manner when he said one day, This lot of ivory now is really mine. The company did not pay for it. I collected it myself at a very great personal risk. I am afraid they will try to claim it as theirs, though. Hmm. It is a difficult case. What do you think I ought to do? Resist? Eh? I want no more than justice. He wanted no more than justice. No more than justice. I rang the bell before a mahogany door on the first floor, and while I waited he seemed to stare at me out of the glassy panel stare with that wide and immense stare embracing, condemning, loathing all the universe. I seemed to hear the whispered cry, The horror! The horror! 
The dusk was falling. I had to wait in a lofty drawing-room with three long windows from floor to ceiling that were like three luminous and bedraped columns. The bent gilt legs and backs of the furniture shone in indistinct curves. The tall marble fireplace had a cold and monumental whiteness. A grand piano stood massively in a corner, with dark gleams on the flat surfaces, like a somber and polished sarcophagus. A high door opened, closed. I rose. She came forward, all in black, with a pale head, floating towards me in the dusk. She was in mourning. It was more than a year since his death, more than a year since the news came. She seemed as though she would remember and mourn forever. She took both my hands in hers and murmured, I had heard you were coming. I noticed she was not very young, I mean not girlish. She had a mature capacity for fidelity, for belief, for suffering. The room seemed to have grown darker, as if all the sad light of the cloudy evening had taken refuge on her forehead. This fair hair, this pale visage, this pure brow seemed surrounded by an ashy halo from which the dark eyes looked out at me. Their glance was guileless, profound, confident, and trustful. She carried her sorrowful head as though she were proud of that sorrow, as though she would say, I, I alone know how to mourn for him as he deserves. But while we were still shaking hands, such a look of awful desolation came upon her face that I perceived she was one of those creatures that are not the playthings of time. For her, he had died only yesterday. And by Jove, the impression was so powerful that for me, too, he seemed to have died only yesterday. Nay, this very minute. I saw her and him in the same instant of time. His death and her sorrow, I saw her sorrow in the very moment of his death. Do you understand? I saw them together, I heard them together. She had said with a deep catch of the breath, I have survived. While my strained ears seemed to hear distinctly, mingled with her tone of despairing regret, the summing up whisper of his eternal condemnation. I asked myself what I was doing there with a sensation of panic in my heart, as though I had blundered into a place of cruel and absurd mysteries, not fit for a human being to behold. She motioned me to a chair. We sat down. I laid the packet gently on the little table, and she put her hand over it. You knew him well, she murmured, after a moment of mourning silence. Intimacy grows quickly out there, I said. I knew him as well as it is possible for one man to know another. And you admired him, she said. It was impossible to know him and not to admire him, was it? He was a remarkable man, I said unsteadily. Then, before the appealing fixity of her gaze, that seemed to watch for more words on my lips, I went on. It was impossible not to. Love him, she finished eagerly silencing me into an appalled dumbness. How true, how true! But when you think that no one knew him so well as I, I had all his noble confidence. I knew him best. You knew him best, I repeated. And perhaps she did. But with every word spoken the room was growing darker, and only her forehead, smooth and white, remained illumined by the inextinguishable light of belief and love. You were his friend, she went on. His friend, she repeated a little louder. You must have been if he had given you this and sent you to me. I feel I can speak to you, and, oh, I must speak. I want you, you who have heard his last words, to know I have been worthy of him. It is not pride. Yes, I am proud to know I understood him better than any one on earth. He told me so himself. And since his mother died, I have had no one, no one, to, to... I listened. The darkness deepened. 
I was not even sure whether he had given me the right bundle. I rather suspect he wanted me to take care of another batch of his papers, which, after his death, I saw the manager examining under the lamp. And the girl talked, easing her pain in the certitude of my sympathy. She talked as thirsty men drink. I had heard that her engagement with Kurtz had been disapproved by her people. He wasn't rich enough or something, and indeed I don't know whether he had not been a pauper all his life. He had given me some reason to infer that it was his impatience of comparative poverty that drove him out there. Who was not his friend who had heard him speak once, she was saying. He drew men towards him by what was best in them. She looked at me with intensity. It is the gift of the great, she went on, and the sound of her low voice seemed to have the accompaniment of all the other sounds, full of mystery, desolation, and sorrow I had ever heard. The ripple of the river, the soughing of the trees swayed by the wind, the murmurs of the crowds, the faint ring of incomprehensible words cried from afar. The whisper of a voice speaking from beyond the threshold of an eternal darkness. But you have heard him, you know, she cried. Yes, I know, I said with something like despair in my heart, but bowing my head before the faith that was in her, before that great and saving illusion that shone with an unearthly glow in the darkness, in the triumphant darkness from which I could not have defended her, from which I could not even defend myself. What a loss to me, to us, she corrected herself with beautiful generosity, then added in a murmur, to the world. By the last gleams of twilight I could see the glitter of her eyes, full of tears, of tears that would not fall. I have been very happy, very fortunate, very proud she went on, too fortunate, too happy for a little while, and now I am unhappy for, for life. She stood up, her fair hair seemed to catch all the remaining light in a glimmer of gold. I rose, too. And all of this, she went on mournfully, all of his promise, and all of his greatness, of his generous mind, of his noble heart. Nothing remains, nothing but a memory. You and I... We shall always remember him, I said hastily. No, she cried. It is impossible that all this should be lost, that such a life should be sacrificed to leave nothing but sorrow. You know what vast plans he had, I knew of them, too. I could not perhaps understand, but others knew of them. Something must remain. His words, at least, have not died. His words will remain, I said. And his example, she whispered to herself. Men looked up to him. His goodness shone in every act. His example, true, I said. His example, too. Yes, his example, I forgot that. But I do not, I cannot, I cannot believe, not yet. I cannot believe that I shall never see him again, that nobody will see him again, never, never, never. She put out her arms as if after a retreating figure, stretching them back with clasped, pale hands across the fading and narrow sheen of the window. Never see him. I saw him clearly enough then. I shall see this eloquent phantom as long as I live, and I shall see her, too, a tragic and familiar shade, resembling in this gesture another one, tragic also, and bedecked with powerless charms, stretching bare brown arms over the glitter of the infernal stream, the stream of darkness. She said suddenly, very low, He died as he lived. His end, said I, with dull anger stirring in me, was in every way worthy of his life. And I was not with him, she murmured. My anger subsided before a feeling of infinite pity. 
everything that could be done, I mumbled. Ah, uh, but I believed in him more than anyone on earth, more than his own mother, more than himself. He needed me, me. I would have treasured every sigh, every word, every sign, every glance. I felt like a chill grip on my chest. Don't, I said in a muffled voice. Forgive me. I, I have mourned so long in silence. In silence. You were with him t to the last? I think of his loneliness. Nobody near to understand him as I would have understood. Perhaps no one to hear. To the very end, I said shakily, I heard his very last words. I stopped in a fright. Repeat them, she murmured in a heartbroken tone. I want, I want something, something to, to live with. I was on the point of crying at her. Don't you hear them? The dusk was repeating them in a persistent whisper all around us, in a whisper that seemed to swell menacingly like the first whisper of a rising wind. The horror, the horror. His last word, to live with, she insisted. Don't you understand? I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. I pulled myself together and spoke slowly. The last word he pronounced was your name. I heard a light sigh, and then my heart stood still, stopped dead short by an exulting and terrible cry, by the cry of inconceivable triumph and of unspeakable pain. I knew it. I was sure. She knew. She was sure. I heard her weeping. She had hidden her face in her hands. It seemed to me that the house would collapse before I could escape, that the heavens would fall upon my head. But nothing happened. The heavens did not fall for such a trifle. Would they have fallen, I wonder, if I had rendered Kurtz that justice which was his due? Hadn't he said he wanted only justice? But I couldn't. I could not tell her. It would have been too dark, too dark altogether. Marlowe ceased and sat apart, indistinct and silent, in the pose of a meditating Buddha. Nobody moved for a time. We have lost the first of the ebb, said the director suddenly. I raised my head. The offing was barred by a black bank of clouds, and the tranquil waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth flowed somber under an overcast sky, seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. End of Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Luoma